Company Art Center, and uh, this is my little book club that I run once a month, sometimes twice a month, like this month, along with my colleague, Michaela Waros, who is so kind to always make sure the tech end goes well. She's here running it for us. And Kelly Murphy, who is in charge of events here and make sure that uh, we're all stocked up with all the wonderful goodies you have. <laughs> but thank you for coming tonight. I know it's going to be a great evening. We have we run our book club every first Thursday of the month, unless it's a book launch like this one is. And then we invite the author to come in on the third Thursday of the month. So first Thursday every month, third Thursday, occasionally like tonight. Mm. Uh, we have been running the book club since 2011 and have welcomed, believe it or not, over 90 regional authors, people who have a relationship here with the Buffalo community like Barbara does. And we're just delighted that you're all here to enjoy her presentation this evening. So I'm going to turn it over to my fellow docent, Marian Deutschman, who is going to introduce Barbara and facilitate tonight's event. Okay. Uh, Barbara needs no introduction. As, as you all walked in, you got a warm welcome from Barbara. So, but I will tell you about the author. Uh, Barbara Sherman Heffron, it was, oh, Heffron at one time, I think you told me, <laughs> initiated a subfield in the rhetoric of health of medicine, and we'll refer to that as RHM uh, in the United States. This is her sixth book. Isn't that a tribute to her? Her love of medicine began as a cardiopulmonary technician and continued to a long career in H R H M, technical and scientific writing, pandemics, and writing studies. I want to tell you a little bit about the book, even though she will tell you a lot about the book. Um, she said it was the toughest book of the six to write. It's a case study that examines the historic discourses surrounding the implementation of a new prevention technique, and that is smallpox inoculation. It was to prevent the, the, the devastating epidemic of smallpox that had visited the new colonies since their start on the American continent. The author examines the various arguments that circulated in the 1720s regarding the project and compares it to today's pandemic, which makes it really interesting, especially having come with a communication background myself, dealing with rhetoric in connection with the 300-year-old uh, inoculation and then the one we suffered through, may I say, recently. So she studies the American overreaction and the complica and complicates, this complicates scientific applications, not with logical scientific perspectives. Does that sound familiar during our pandemic? <laughs> or even with ethical views, but instead, Many people brought exaggerated claims founded on uniquely American historical, religious, racial, territorial, and political ideologies. And I think something that we should probably start with, since it's 300 years old, we probably need a history of smallpox and the impact that it had on medicine in, in America and England. If you want to start with something else, it's your book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will start with, with something else. But first of all, thank you for, for coming. I really, really appreciate it. It's really wonderful. And um, I am going to read a paper, which may seem a little weird instead of just talk. But I am going to read it because there's a lot of details in the book and I tend to go off on tangents and I would never get to the point <laughs> if I didn't write it and read it. So, so I'm going to be reading it. Um, and then at the end, we'll have questions and, and you know, 
there'll be some slides along the way as well. Okay. America's First Vaccination is a nonfiction book, but it also has a strong narrative, one that actually happened in our history in Boston in 1721 and 1722. First, I'll tell you a short version of the story, then go into more detail. The tale begins with a violent attack. In 1721, Cotton Mather, a famous if controversial minister, and his family were awakened in the middle of the night by the screams of their young nephew, who was sleeping in a room on the first floor. Someone had lobbed what was then called a granado into his room. A granado is a Molotov cocktail or firebomb. Fortunately, it did not go off. The whole family could have lost their lives in a bad fire. Attached was a note meant for cotton. Damn you, a pox on you. The attempt had been made because Cotton Mather was the main initiator of an inoculation or vaccination during a smallpox pandemic in Boston. The attack occurred even though, even though after almost 300 people had gotten the vaccination and survived, only, and only six of the, of the 300 had, had died, and most of those six were from other causes. At least every 20 years or less, smallpox swept through the town, killing, maiming, or disfiguring the newest generation of Bostonians or those who had not had the disease before. We, we haven't seen uh, smallpox in our lifetimes unless you have been um, in Africa maybe in the late 1970s. Uh, but this is what it looks yeah. like. It's it's pretty horrendous. And, um, you know, it's kind of uh, almost easy to, to identify because of this kind of distinctive um, pox. Yeah, pox. <laughs> Although Matter was a minister, it was Mary in the early religious colonies for the minister to take care of the parishioners' bodies as well as souls although some ministers attempted more medical work than others. Even though very religious, Puritans were also interested in science, especially the intelligentsia. Literary, literacy was high in Boston, as many homes had Bibles, and per parishioners were supposed to read them. Mather had attended Harvard at age 11. His father had been president at Harvard for a time. Although it was Cotton Mather who had first been interested in trying the procedure against smallpox, it was Zabdiel Boylston, a practicing physician, that he persuaded to do the majority of the inoculations. After a number of, success, of successes, a few other physicians outside of Boston also inoculated their patients. Boylston kept exact notes and reports on each patient. Here are the numbers he recorded and the dates. You can see up here, he made a little table. Uh, of, and this is from June 1721 until May 1722. And you see how many on the, on the left, the left numbers are how many he inoculated in, in one month. And then on the right is um, the six people who died that he kept track of. And those are the names of, of the people mm -hmm. uh, that, that he uh, that had passed away. This story has an ironic twist as well. Except for Boylston and those few physicians out of town, ministers were the main supporters of the smallpox vaccinations, and no other physicians were supporters. In fact, the lead physician in Boston, a European educated Scot, campaigned very mightily against it. There were some legitimate reasons one might be worried about this new medical technology, as it used the fluid of a live smallpox virus from a patient currently under the throes of the disease. However, today our vaccinations are made of both live killed and synthetically produced viruses. At least that was the case before COVID and perhaps the new mRNA vaccination. It, uh, like Boylston's and Mather's efforts, introduced kind of a new type of vaccine. 
and there's um, oh, that's Cotton Mather. That's a picture of him. <laughs> Some medical professionals may worry that I use vaccination, inoculation, and variolation. What variolation means? The smallpox used to be called variola, so variolation meant this technique was used for smallpox interchangeably. And I apologize to physicians in the, in the audience for that. Um, because of the state of medicine in early 1700s, the process of introducing a substance into the patient's body was so different from the rest of the standard practices of that time that it made a great departure from what was then humoral medicine, you know, the four humors. In 1720s medicine, patients might eat or drink something or have pult poultices and other external medicines applied or been bled by leeches or barber surgeons who did blood, blood, blood letting, sorry. But before Mather and Boylston, no lancet had been used to cut the skin and then push into the wound the fluid from a disease. If the firebomb did not deliver the explosion the bomber hoped it would, the print media of the time did. Boston, a town of 10,000, had during this time three newspapers, the Boston Gazette, the Boston Newsletter, and the New England Courant. The Boston Gazette was supportive of the Mather Boylston Initiative, but the Newsletter and the New England Courant were adamantly against it. It's believed that the third paper, the Courant, was started in order to go up against the Mathers and vaccinations. It was started by James and Benjamin Franklin, the Benjamin Franklin. But he was a very young man at the time, so perhaps we can forget. James was the older brother and had returned from a considerable time in London learning the printing trade, and he even brought a printing press with him from London. Besides the brother's need to put his training into practice, Ben Franklin asked to be apprenticed to his brother in the printing business rather than what had been his current apprenticeship to his father in the candle making business at age 11. He had been pulled out of school at 11 to uh, work, work in candles. Both brothers hated the Mathers and worked hard to publish many articles, opinion pieces, and misinformation regarding the dangers of the variolation against smallpox. Fighting through throughout the two years of the pandemic, those against the practice succeeded in shutting it down. It will never be known how many lives were lost, immunizations were not continued. Ben Franklin him, himself would not change his opinion until after his four-year-old son died of smallpox in 1736. Mm -hmm. He did write at the time that he regretted his earlier decision to fight against vaccination. There's a picture of Ben Franklin, but when he was older, they, they didn't make portraits of kids. Sons <laughs> 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 of candle makers, maybe especially. In general, most Bostonians were enraged, and the town council, the, the select men of, of Boston, ordered the inoculations to stop. Boylston did so for a short time, but then continued them very discreetly. He was later celebrated in London, where he presented his carefully kept notes and charts of his patients. And today in Boston, you can still see the name of Boylston reflected in street names, for example. Having discovered this story in Cotton Mather's medical compendium, my questions were many, but the main one was, why did the people so strongly object to what proved to be a successful way of stopping the disease? Because of the fame of the Mathers and the literacy practices of Bostonians, many documents from that time were preserved, mostly at Harvard and Cambridge and at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Mass. Thus, most of, most of my archival work was done in Massachusetts. The Antiquarian Society also has all the books from both Increase Mathers, Cotton's father, and Cotton's libraries. Their libraries were the largest and best in the colonies at the time. 
combing through their books, letters, diaries, documents, and other texts from those two years, I was able to get a picture of why the life-saving technique was so vehemently rejected. As a rhetorician, I was trained to analyze arguments and also provide understanding of cultural phenomena. The rest of my talk will be about the reasons the Bostonians were against it. And lastly, a comparison between then and our recent COVID pandemic, as Marion mentioned. When I found, what I found were more similarities and convergences than differences in the 300 time period, 300 year time period. The irony deepens, <clears throat> excuse me, because one of the most stated reasons against the inoculation was religion. Even though most Puritan ministers joined with Mather and Boylston in advocating variolation, while the physicians, apothecaries, barbers, herbalists, and surgeons were against. Yet the anti-vaxxers used religious arguments against the procedure, even though the minister's theology was much more studied than, the, than that of the doctors and other Bostonians on their side. Because their religion was based on Calvinism and predestination, the parishioners believed that inoculations against smallpox opposed the will of God. They also believed suffering illnesses and disease was a, was a way God was telling the people or warning them about their own transgressions and punishing them for their sins. How were they to learn to obey God if a man-made technique helped them escape punishment or death? The anti-vaxxer who most often wrote besides William Doug Douglas, who was the Scottish doctor, was John Williams, also known as Mundungus, which means stinking tobacco. <laughs> he was exceptionally illiterate compared to others, even though he was the town apothecary and tobacconist. It seemed that with much help, most likely from James or Ben Franklin, he attempted in his publications and letters to the editor of the Quran to mimic the educated syllogistic <clears throat> arguments of the mostly Harvard educated ministers. Fear was noticeably thick and volatile in the midst of that, of that current pandemic for that time. Many Bostonians turned to religion, give them hope in yet, in yet another onslaught of smallpox. But their fear had also fueled anger and violent tendencies. Boylston had to move furtively through the town after dark, often at midnight, to check on patients and do more inoculations because at times angry anti-vaxxers marched in the streets shouting that they intended to find and hang him. Let's see. Oh, wow. good. You have it up already. <laughs> this is actually um, a cartoon from a newspaper in London. Our, um, our uh, American presses were not quite yet that fine that they could do the, the graphics. So, um, but it shows that England that was also undergoing the same pandemic uh, had had also had some uh, folks working hard against it and then some for it. Over here on the side that is asking for um, for vaccinations, the, God, the, the bubble above says, oh, brothers, brothers, suffer the love of gain to be overcome by compassion for your fellow creatures. Do not delight to plunge whole families in the deepest distress by the untimely loss of their nearest and dearest relatives. And over here, they're saying um, things against, against vaccinations. Also, although colonial Pur Puritans were often literate, they did not have whole libraries or books about science, unlike the Mathers. In addition, Mather had access to scientific papers, what were considered scientific papers during that time. From the Royal Society in London, that society gathered or was a repository for interesting natural or medical phenomena around the world, or especially the English speaking world. Science at that time was called natural philosophy 
and the materials were shared between the literati in Europe and those in America, such as Mather. But the minister did not learn of the vaccination idea, idea or procedure first from his sources in London. He learned it earlier from his enslaved man, Onesimus. In 1706, his parishioners had bought a man who had spent time enslaved on an island plantation and been shipped off to northeast, to the northeast, and they had given him to Cotton Mather. Mather asked, had asked Onesimus if he had smallpox, mm -hmm. which at the time was not an unusual question in those days. Often, if it didn't kill you, smallpox maimed or weakened you so that you would not be a competent worker. Onesimus described for Cotton the vaccination he had received in his own country in Africa and therefore maintained he would not get the disease. And this is uh, one of the um, sale uh, posters that's put up for uh, the enslaved people coming in. And this is Charleston, South Carolina in April 27, 1769. So it's later, but the same the same thing was going on at the time. It's just hard to find uh, the, the, the sale bills from that time. And the reason I chose this one is they, um, they talk about smallpox here. And they're, this, that little fine print or smaller print there, this is the vessel that had the smallpox on, on board at the time of her arrival, the 31st of March last. Every necessary precaution has since been taken to cleanse both ship and cargo, thoroughly talking about human beings, so that those who may be inclined to purchase need not be under the least apprehension of danger from infection. The Negroes are allowed to be the likeliest parcel that have been imported this season. So, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's not good. Um, it was a few years later that Mather began to learn of the same pr procedure as the one practiced on Onesimus. From some Turks and, and a Greek woman inoculator via the Royal Society newsletters that came regularly, other ministers supporting Mather interviewed their enslaved men and women and other Africans in Boston and kept hearing the same story about the vaccination. When another wave of smallpox had hit later, Mather recruited Boylston to try the technique. He had also sent a letter about the practice to the other physicians, but they did not join with or support him. When Mather had written about Onesimus, other Africans and the Turks and Greeks having undergone smallpox vaccination, the anti-vaxxers published racist and anti-black columns in the two anti-Mather papers. William Douglas, the Scottish doctor's letter to the editors, were the most vehemently racist and anti-black. Oops, I hear this. Yeah, that's the one. Um, this is a picture of the plan for um, bringing enslaved people over from Africa. And you can see, how could anybody employ avoid infection of any they're they're stacked together and they're on shelves and the shelves are about this far above the person they have a little breathing space and then you're jammed up next to other people and um when i first saw that it didn't make it into the book because i couldn't um i couldn't uh make it work for the size of the book mm. so but I could keep but I kept the slide because I think it I think it's very important to show so let's see later after the Royal Society publications about the practice had been written the anti-vaxxers had written tracts against Turks and Greek women who inoculated people against smallpox so they used that in the letters to the editor and stuff complaining these xenophobic and misogynistic responses were also very strident and insulting. The anti-vax Bostonians called them Mohammedans, in other words, Muslims. The Greek woman was especially suspect because she was a woman. 
The Quran had then carried not just anti-Black, but also anti-Muslim and misogynistic letters. Another trend in the arguments I read referenced Cotton Mather's character. This was a big surprise to me. I didn't, I didn't anticipate this kind of argument. Some older Bostonians who were now town leaders had been in their 20s, as had Cotton been, during the Salem witchcraft trials. Cotton Mather had not been a judge, but had written two large books about the various witchcraft practices he had heard about in Salem and Boston and in England. In addition, he had also written about witches and their activities that he himself experienced firsthand when he had brought a 15-year-old girl claiming to be possessed into his home for a number of weeks. He wrote that he had seen her fly unaided across the room and perform many other worldly feats. After reading both of his long witchcraft books, I had written in my book that if witchcraft needed a publicist or a very popular influencer, matter would be the one to choose. <laughs> The leaders of Boston and on the Selectmen or Town Council were in the 1720s. They were in their 50s and 60s, as was Cotton Mather. They remembered him getting carried away with the, mitch, with the witchcraft trials and worried that the smallpox inoculation was maybe such another, another such aberration. The Bostonians and Salem Lights had been part of a mass hysteria in the late 1680s and 1690s and were afterwards deeply repulsed and regretted that the people had really regretted that they had disrupted in some cases ended many women's lives. Allusions were made to Mather's past enthusiasm in the 1720s arguments against vaccination. And that's um, one of the few uh, uh, pictures I could find that had been done for, from the witchcraft trials. And I'm not sure if the witch, the quote witch, is the woman standing up here or the one fainted on the floor or both of them, I don't know. In addition to Mather's character and his past actions, there was already a strong strain of anti-intellectualism in the arguments against vaccination published at this time. Few had the opportunity to attend Harvard, which at that time was the only possible place to get higher education. Most fields otherwise offered apprenticeships, even for physicians and surgeons. Most of the time on the, on the job training was the rule. Ben Franklin had been forced to drop out of school to work for his father at, at 11, while Cotton Mather went to Harvard at 11. The college was tiny then though, and not in the best shape. Cotton's class had five students in it. The college had mainly been for educating ministers, so it was more like a seminary in the earliest days. Mather though, because he had a terrible stutter as a child and adolescent too, was not sure he could follow in his ministerial fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers and probably great-great-grandfather's profession. So at Harvard, he had taken courses in natural philosophy or science. There were a couple of courses, hoping to be a physician. He had, however, been able to overcome his stutter and produced many books of sermons. I read uh, quite a few of them. They were long and not remarkable. <laughs> There were at the time great class differences between the ministers and other Bostonians, a situation that has been richly painted in the academicus dialogues. They illustrated well why, why there were such attacks on the theocratic leaders at this time. The first dialogue was written by a very bright Harvard student and maybe Cotton Mather assisted, not, we don't know for sure. The humorous parody illustrated the difference between those who spoke and wrote well and those who did not. Then another par parody had come out answering the first one written most likely by John Checkley, a close friend of the Franklins and very opposed to variolations. He may have been aided by Mundungus himself. That's the tobacco guy who was kind of illiterate, since he and his writings were the target of that first parody. 
perhaps with the help of the Franklins. In other publications, specifically the Silence Do Good letters that were published in the Karat, Harvard was viciously attacked and its students, teachers, and leaders raked over the coals. The Silence Do Good letters appeared at first to be anonymous, but it was discovered these were written by the young, young Ben Franklin, who resented the privileges men like Cotton Mather and other ministers had enjoyed, for example, higher education, while he had been pulled out of school at 11 only to be apprenticed. Here we can still see another reason why the inocul inoculators were resented in their attempts to save people stopped by the Bostonians. Resentment of the ministers and theocracy in Boston, racism and xenophobia, fear regarding Cotton Mather's character, and the by-the-book religion and fear of a vengeful God, all, fe all fell fed into the shutting down of smallpox vaccinations in 1721 and 22. These issues were present in, in the arguments found in the very many documents preserved from this, these times. I had worked on the research off and on for a number of years in between teaching, being an administrator and working on other books as archival research that I couldn't find digitally, which was quite a bit of it, <laughs> had to be conducted in Massachusetts. I had several drafts of the book when COVID arrived in the US. I had all the data I needed and during COVID, the time to do a final draft. As I did so, the more I engaged with the work again, the more I saw overlaps in the culture from, from 300 years ago and how American citizens reacted very recently, not all of them, of course, to the pandemic and the reception of our own vaccination, as well as the cultural phenomena that ensued. Of course, there were differences as well. For one thing, most doctors have been supportive of their vaccinations for COVID. Those that had not been as supportive would have been outliers. Some and maybe quite a few ministers, however, were not supportive of vaccinations as the country became more and more polarized in the last seven years. Those ministers and parishioners of multiple religious denominations that had made up the Tea Party membership, also a term, by the way, that harkens back to the 1700s and the American Revolution, often espoused resistance to tests and vaccination. Here's an example of uh, one of our anti-vaxxers at, um, at a health clinic where I live. My God does not equal pharma. And just as the witchcraft trials in the late 1600s, the 1720s and now, we see misinformation and conspiracy theories abound and find traction. Instead of newspapers, town criers, and pub con conversations, we have social media. In addition, there's also been a rise in hate crimes against African Americans, Asian Americans, and new immigrants. Racism has reared its head, yet there has been some progress in seeing that today at least the actions and problems are made more public and sometimes adjudicated, a lot of times not. Mm -hmm. To hear Arabs refused entrance to our country reminded me of the arguments against vaccinations being banned because the source was possibly Mohat, Mahatmatan or Muslim 300 years ago. We have to see the rage today among some people who are impoverished or lack the privileges of the upper classes, especially against the 1% or those even who have no student debts, for example, and have easily been able to get into Harvard, other Ivies and prestigious schools of education. <laughs> as I mentioned at the beginning, as a rhetorician, we are taught to analyze arguments and other types of speaking and or writing, which is what I did throughout the book. The entire text can be said to be a rhetorical <clears throat> and cultural analysis. The first book on rhetoric was written by Aristotle. Thus, we still have Greek terms attached to various functions, such as, and, and medicine also has many Greek and Latin terms. There are two words in Greek referring to time, 
One is chronos, which most people would be familiar with because it's the root to chronological and, and chronology. And the other one's called kairos, which refers to timing. Kairos calls for a sense of knowing when the time is right for a message to be delivered. That's why the book had to come now. It had to come out now because it makes sense to interrogate our cultural ph phenomena, try to understand them, and even search within our history for precedence. Thanks for coming and letting me talk to you. <laughs> If I could ask a question first, uh, it seems to me that you had a lot of opposition, and yet, uh, or not you, but at the time of the smallpox inoculation, there wasn't the public acceptance. And yet, you do say that this was um, the start of public health today, it was the beginning. And so, there were some good things that happened that, that came from the situation. Um, some well, for three hundred people, for sure, that was good because because most of them survived, or at least for two hundred and ninety <clears throat> people, that was good. Um, I'm I'm trying to think of something else. It's something uh, because there were a lot of contradictions, uh, the physicians, Parsons, religion, uh, yes. contradictions because of the Puritans, and so much. But yet, yeah, you said it laid the groundwork for public health today. That that was uh, especially because the select men were part of it. So the government, the city government, you know, we know at this time the colony is not free because the revolution hasn't happened yet. So they, the governor is chosen by the crown, the British crown, and sent into uh, Boston. And those, the, I think they, I think he had uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, if I remember right. So, but but the local cities, especially one as large as Boston, could um, have its own city council, and so those were the people that often, you know, made the decisions. And um, there's there's a, a person who wrote a book back in the 1950s, arguing that this was the first occasion of public health. It turned out uh, an attempt to to make this happen, but it, it was, it was, it failed because of the selectment, but it was part of the government. It was, you know, mm -hmm. so in that way, I think that was, that was kind of at the heart of his argument in his book. Yeah. Have you in your studies, I find it interesting having taught medical microbiology for a long time, oh, neat. comparing the response as you're presenting to the variolation and smallpox and now the COVID and compare that to what was going on in the 1960s when the polio vaccine was introduced. And I don't remember any arguments. I mean, people were yeah. clamoring to get it. Yeah. Have you seen, were the scientists better at presenting the arguments for this? In in a way, I, I, I had that same question at one point and that what I what I think it's not hundred percent certain. What I think was because the children were were being affected. So it's the because, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, not in, in smallpox. Children are affected as well. But then it was just it was just too new. And Cotton Mather had a microscope. He thought when he wrote his his compendium, he thought. He saw under his microscope, he put some of the um, stuff from the postule, the fluid from the postule there. And he saw little things swimming around and he thought, that's smallpox. It wasn't. No. It was, it was some bacteria or something, maybe, if he was lucky. Um, but he had the right idea. And germ theory was also being discussed in, you know, as early as 1500s and 1600s in Europe. Oh, so, you know, people were starting to go down this path, but it, you know, they it wasn't public. It wasn't very public. Steve, oh. describe the the practice of inoculation. Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to. 
Um, this is, um, there, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, but but uh, when Mather wrote about it, his recommendation was that you make, you know, you, you take the little lancet that they use for bleeding and you can do an arm or a leg, you know, wherever. And then, then someone else would have gone and gotten from a, a um, smallpox victim who had a very, you know, hard case at the time. It was very, uh, a lot of pox and it was very, what, what they called ripe pustules um, and, and got some of the fluid, put it on a little piece of, of like cotton and put it in their, in their pocket to keep it warm next to their body <laughs> so that, you know, it was still, um, yeah, right. still alive and fresh, I suppose. And then that person would transfer it to another person. This was confusing to me. Like, so weren't you all in getting infected yourself? <laughs> yeah. But maybe they sent people who had already had smallpox. I don't know. But um, then they pass it on to uh, the doctor Zabdiel Boylston or some of the others. And they have made these made places in the arm and they they start pushing in that fluid. They push in the fluid that they got, you know, infecting the person on purpose. And then there there were two ways mentioned. One was to put uh, secure a walnut shell over that area. And another one was to wrap it with a big cabbage leaf and secure it oh so to keep it in there and keep it on there. How long did it take before they saw a change where they could be convinced that this was making a difference? They, you, oh, difference. You mean like a person getting small better? Pox yeah. Or, getting... or, and then becoming immune. I think it was it, the usual um, time period was it probably around a week or so. Oh. And they, and they kept track. I mean, he, every day, saw the patients, you know, during the month that he had inoculated them and made sure. To um, see. Before yeah. we go, I have one person. Jasira, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Okay. Hi, Jasira. You're still muted, Jasira. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Steve asked one for, for me. That was one part of my question. Yeah. Um, is, you know, was there a problem was some of the resistance due to the way it was administered. But then when I remembered about bloodletting and leeches, I'm, I'm sure yeah. nothing yeah. people off that <laughs> that's true. That's true. But my other question is, um, like many discoveries, it probably happened simultaneously in many places, but I always remember a cowpox thing where um, a cow herd woman figured it out or discovered it in Britain. So was something similar going on in Britain? That was actually later and cowpox was used instead of the actual smallpox. Okay. That was later. Uh, Just yeah. a comment. We're all of an age. We've probably all gotten the smallpox vaccine. <laughs> right, right. Just with the cowpox, but they did it the same way. They make this yes. fraction. Yes. Poke, 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 poke. Oh, it's yep. not a nice vaccine. No, no. But yes, uh, Harvey. Um, do we have any clue why, if people were being infected with live smallpox vaccine, why didn't they come down with a full blown disease? Um, that might be a question for a doctor to answer. I, I don't know why. Okay. I, don't, I don't know why, but it was, um, I mean, they would get sick and the yeah. charts show that yeah. the people were, were very yeah. ill, mm -hmm. but still there were so few deaths. One, one, um, one place I did read that Boylston himself was particularly very clean about what he was doing. So they don't get, I guess, a um, like sepsis, like a huge mm -hmm. infection at the wound or something. Yeah. You know, that, mm -hmm. and they, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember reading that during, around the time of the revolution, there was another outbreak of smallpox and Benjamin Franklin and Benjamin Rush were very much involved in getting people to submit to um, variolation. 
That's that's right. And and that um that's you know, he had changed his mind earlier before the revolution. And there are some theories that uh without that without that being done, because they got the soldiers, uh George Washington soldiers, and they they inoculated them, you know, whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> they wanted I, I guess if your boss tells you you gotta do it, you know. Yeah. Um <clears throat> I think one of the things that's so obvious from what we know about today and, and your yeah. talk yeah. is the vagaries of social consensus. Yes, very and good. When, very when good. Yeah. we were inoculated as children uh, yeah. in the 60s, 50s, etc., cetera, um, there was a different uh, ethos. There was a different uh, system of, of thought vis-a-vis government vis-a-vis -vis institutions vis-a-vis -vis medicine right and that permitted it but at other times this has shifted yeah yeah Good point. it's true that's mm -hmm. true it's very true yeah jim um you know uh no our god is not pharma <laughs> right but pharma you know is right to be attacked because of the opiate crisis yep yep so that struck me. Yeah, as an interesting tact, right? Yeah. Tact and tact. the six people that died, they didn't die of smallpox. I think one might have, one or two might have, but they probably were already, um, they had had been infected already, but it just hadn't shown up yet. That was, that was. That was like part of, must have been part of the argument then, right? that, mm -hmm. that people that would normally live would die of the vaccination. That was part of the argument. I mean, they worried about that very much. Mm -hmm. But then also there was the whole problem of just like now when you can't publish jurors' names, et cetera, with, without it being dangerous, then they didn't they didn't feel comfortable publishing the patients' names who had survived and all that in Boston for fear these people would be attacked. Mm -hmm. But he was able to do the identifications and show, showed the charts in London then where, you know, it wouldn't get back to mm -hmm. Boston to, to be cruel to someone who had gotten the vaccination and was doing very well. Yeah. Uh -huh. Andrew. I was interested in the remark you made about how Benjamin Franklin and his brother were anti uh -huh. uh, um, on the question. And after I thought about it, your explanation, um, I thought that if anyone was uh, the emblematic figure of religion in that period, it certainly was Cotton Mather. Yeah. And <laughs> a free thinker, maybe at even age yeah. 10, 15, yeah. 18, Early. Benjamin Franklin would have had anti cotton mather feelings mm -hmm. and the whole establishment yeah. because of their religiosity. Yeah, yeah. And the, there were they're starting to be um pushback against the theocracy, pushback against England, you know. So it's not as if all of a sudden people woke up in 1776 and said, let's take this this country away from Britain, you know, let's let's take it back. Um they, you know, in, instead it bubbles up along the way and grows and gets more more fervent all the time. Fifty years later, you know, plus. Yeah. So more on the way you talked about, uh, I think I, I particularly appreciated then and now that okay. section, yeah. uh, and the question of who owns the body now. Mm -hmm. And the subjugation and uh, how has medicine affected us? Yeah. And who owns the body? I mean, and we're saying this now after Dobbs, right? So, I mean, who who still owns the bodies, right? That's yeah. right. And they, and they were, I, I know that uh, William Douglas, who was a Scottish doctor, he wrote against uh, Mather, maybe not even realizing that the ministers had to be helping their parishioners. All the ministers' wives had kitchen herb gardens where they got 
various things that they could help the parishioners with. And, and you know, in, in the early start of the um, colonies, they were, the theocracy was in charge of the body and of everything. And then we have some doctors, including a very educated doctor who got a uh, European university education as a, as a physician, uh, which we didn't have here yet. Uh, he he thought no the the physician should be able to be in charge of the body not the ministers you know so this is an interesting point <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um, I remember that about a generation later the exact opposite happened in that disease was used against human beings when the British, uh -huh. uh, and some of you may remember the incident, I think it was smallpox. They traded goods with the Indians, their non-Indian allies, mm -hmm. and had um, disease in the blankets mm -hmm. and gave Lord it to the Indians. <laughs> Good old Lord Amherst, yeah. Lord Jeff. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that happened. Uh, yeah. What's your next project? Oh, <laughs> I uh, did a, a lot of research on uh, leprosy. Actually, you, mm -hmm. you can tell I'm such a cheerful person. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Pandemics and leprosy. <laughs> um, but um, there was the, uh, the only open mainland leprosarium just south of LSU where I was teaching and the National Hansen's Disease um, Center, which is the name of, of leprosy now, mm -hmm. um, was, was at LSU where I was teaching. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So I visited there. I found out about the leprosarium. I had some friends who helped me get a, um, a, a, kind of a personal tour to do to you know to to go ahead and um and and see what was going on there now at this point i mean leprosy doesn't have to be quarantined anymore you know because there's a if you catch it early it can be a cure but it's also managed well uh if, as long as you have the you know excess excess and so it was like i thought oh yeah i would so i studied several summers there at a museum where they had archives. And I also um, interviewed one of the last patients. There were five patients still there because they had spent their whole lives there, 70, oh you know, 60, 70 years, and they didn't want to go to a nursing home. So it was later closed. Then Pam Fessler wrote a book yeah. about, about leprosy because her husband's <clears throat> father, father or grandfather, had um, been been at uh, Carville Leprosarium. Yeah, Karen. You can do it then and now because they have leprosy in Florida. I know. Thank you. I was like, oh my yeah, God. More than one kind. So I, I bought Pam Fessler's book and I liked it so much that I thought, no, I'm I'm not going to write it, but I would have. <laughs> Hers is great. I really liked it. So she, she pointed out some things I would have pointed out or wanted to talk about. So wow. I'm not sure what it is yet. <laughs> I'd wasn't, like, oh, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, wasn't there a, a colony, liberal colony on the Hawaiian Islands? Yes. 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 Okay. That's it, right. it, was, it was closed before the Carville one, but just very slightly. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah their, their patients had left. Jim. I, I recall somebody visiting that and they had a speech along. The visitors had to speak at a certain distance to the, oh. to the patients and they sterilized the envelopes. And so yeah, yada, yada, yada stuff. there were all kinds of things. And, and from the research I did, um, I discovered that you have to have a certain gene in order to be susceptible oh. to leprosy. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh. Yeah. And and also there, um, it's carried by um, what's that animal's name? Armadillos, and you know there's a lot of armadillos in Louisiana. But they also Carville had people from all over the world. The man I interviewed was originally he had been born in the Philippines. 
So, yeah. Something comparable to what's happening today, you said the minds of colonists were carefully uh, carefully trained and molded. Now, is that primarily by religious beliefs? Yeah, yeah. And I, now we have social media, and we have yeah. all kinds of media doing that. Yeah, and and the newspapers. But, you know, the theocracy had been very strong, but now it was starting to weaken during that time. And um, my, my biggest fear, which is, I, I know is, is crazy, is that... Um, we would go back to a theocracy, mm-hmm. you know, and that that terrifies me because it's just wrong, mm-hmm. you know, to mandate that that people have have to abide by this one religion and not all the various religions that are now in our country. Yeah. Well, I think that theocracy was mainly in in Boston. In the Boston College. Yes, it was. <laughs> the pilgrims who came here for the freedom to oppose other people, <laughs> to, to make them follow them instead of someone else. In fact, uh, like they kicked out um, uh, Roger Williams. Williams. Oh, yes. Williams. Williams. Yeah, Williams. Roger Williams, who founded Rhode Island. Rhode Island. But it was different in the other colonies, which was one of the main reasons for religious liberty, because the colonies couldn't otherwise get along with each other. Right, right. That, uh, and I know Mather personally from his diaries, he was against the Congregationalists. He was against the Quakers and had made some move against the Quakers in the late 1600s. So, yeah, there's not a lot of open-mindedness or tolerance. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Barbara? Yeah. Was there any pattern amongst those who agreed to get vaccinated? Was there any obvious pattern as to who they were, their level of education? Maybe they were Jewish. There was never anything um, that I read that said that, you know, um, that said how, uh, I, th- I think just some people who maybe knew and trusted Boylston, you know, the doctor or or Mather, I don't know, or their ministers, other ministers. I'm not sure how they decided it would be okay for them to try, you know, that people would want to do this. Some people had their um, their uh, slaves also um, had, had their enslaved people mm-hmm. inoculated. And like it's mentioned, one of the young women who died was... Um, an uh, Indian slave because they had American Indian slaves. You have some white slaves. You have uh, black slaves. You have sure. No. Or, yeah. Since you make reference to the origin coming from Africa, does that mean your book is banned in Florida? <laughs> Probably. I think they Probably. it out. One one thing I would like to follow up on is to find out more about Onesimus. About what? About what? The this the uh, enslaved man that Mather had, who first oh, told right. him about it, because it's, there's a strong possibility that maybe the first vaccination in America was done because of the, the knowledge slave. of the slave. an enslaved the slave. man. So we don't know a lot about the practice in Africa. Well, a, a little bit. I read some ancient ship logs. And they knew that um, they knew that uh, some ships captains knew that to try to get them vaccinated, they had they would make like these forts on the coast, oh, yeah. and you would have different um, different uh, tribes from Africa or countries from Africa. They tried to mix them up on the ships and to so that they couldn't have the same language and they couldn't communicate with each other and do an uprising. Hmm. So that's one thing that they made sure of, but they wanted to, some of the ship's captain said, we're going to, uh, what do you call it? I don't do shipping. I mean, I don't know boats. Uh, they would do a layover, lay in, no, what is it? Well, anyway, they 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 would um, land and have their, at one of these fort things and have their 
uh, people, their, their enslaved people inoculated. And then a, a story from the Africans in Boston said that um, they had, uh, when they went to another tribe or another country, they would ask to be, um, they, they would, the young men who hadn't yet been vaccinated would, would want to be vaccinated so that they didn't get smallpox when they traveled to do a hunt or trade goods or something like that. I, I found um, that it was also in China at the time, probably in a, in a number of other countries. So we don't know the original or, origin, which is why I just concentrated on America. Probably leaked from a lab. Yes, <laughs> from a lab in China. <laughs> Any other questions? Or, or, Jim? Yes, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, he didn't mention the AIDS crisis in his whole first term. Oh, and so here he is, you know, uh, that stigma. Yeah. Stigma. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, that that had some of that as part of it, too. And then in Brooklyn, you know, there's the Jewish community that didn't want to have the measles vaccine. Well, there's a lot of people. I mean, I know some friends of my daughter, she gets a little irritated with them, but um, they are anti vaccination for their kids, any kind of vaccination. Oh, boy. And all you have to do is to go to an older cemetery. And look at all the graves of the babies and the children. Look at, read them and see how it used to be. It just used to be so horrible. Well, and look at the rubella and autism. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's that's a big that's reason totally for the current ones. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you for coming. Oh, Bye. thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone for coming tonight and please go online and look at our website and see what's coming up in our book club down the line. The next one is September 7th and the book is I, Pharaoh, A New Kingdom. And I'm going to get this name right, Emmanuel Pula. So it's going to be another interesting book. I don't know if they can top you though, Barbara. It was such a very sweet. evening and certainly a well-researched book. And thank you so much for finding me coming tonight and thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.